in a national battle over hydraulic fracturing. The ground keeps shaking in Oklahoma. There's human activity that is driving the increase in temperature on the Earth. In 2008, my organization, Food and Water Watch, started getting calls from our supporters and members in the northeastern U.S. saying, you better look into fracking. It took us a little while to start looking into fracking, but when we did, we realized it was very dangerous and probably couldn't be regulated. In 2011, after writing a couple of reports on it, working with a number of the impacted communities, we became the first national organization to call for a ban on fracking and worked with over 200 grassroots groups in New York State to eventually ban fracking. So it was during this period that I started doing some of the research on this book. And I'll tell you what drove me to it. It was the lack of progress that we have made on renewable energy and energy efficiency. In the mid-1990s, I worked on a program called Power in the Midwest for the Union of Concerned Scientists. And at the time, our slogan was, renewables are ready. And they were ready at that time, as were energy efficiency technologies. So, we started looking at the statistics about how much progress we had made towards renewable electricity. And it's really stunning. We have made so little progress. Uh, these are the new statistics since 2015. And you can see that wind, solar, and geothermal are only 5.5% of our electricity, and yet we're moving forward with um, turning to electricity for many of our needs, like transportation. So I decided to really go back and do a study of how the industry had actually been able to turn the tide against renewables. But before we go there, I want to talk a little bit about what fracking is, because I know you suffer from a lot of the infrastructure in this part of the country, but you don't actually have fracking. So although many of you probably know what it is, let me start with a short description. It's a science fiction-like process where large quantities of water, chemicals, and very fine sand are um, sent deep underground by very high pressure. Basically what happens is that a well is drilled a mile or even two miles under the ground, and then uh, a tunnel is drilled horizontally, uh, sometimes as far, and then over a, a period of multiple stages, the fracking takes place. 
And you can imagine that lots of things can happen underground um, that we're not aware of, and often the casing of the well goes bad. One of the major problems with fracking uh, are the large quantities of water. So um, on average, 1.7 million gallons to 13 million gallons a well uh, in places like Texas, 50 times more than conventional drilling. And what happens with all that water and chemicals? It surges back out of the well. So we have about 10.5 billion gallons of wastewater to deal with. And of course, the water is a big problem. This is a fracking site in Pennsylvania. You can see the, uh, the uh, waste pit where uh, the fracking wastewater sometimes ends up. This is what an industrialized fracking site looks like. Sometimes there are um, 30, 40, 50 wells like this in a uh, vicinity, really in industrializes rural areas. Of course, there's fracking going on in, in urban areas as well, places like um, Fort Worth, uh, Dallas area in Texas, even inside of LA, Los Angeles, in the city limits. Um, a lot of pollution from uh, fracking, a lot of air pollution, not just water pollution. And then, of course, all of the pipelines. And that's been a real battle here in the Northwest. You uh, uh, have had a great movement that helped uh, stop one large uh, pipeline that was planned, the Pacific Connector. And of course, uh, there were two liquefied natural gas plants in Oregon that were recently rejected, and uh, which is very unusual. And I think in part it's because of the huge uh, movement. Of course, uh, building pipes creates a lot of damage, and sometimes these pipes are hundreds, if not thousands, of miles long. And of course, each well uh, takes about a hundred large or a thousand, rather, a thousand large truckloads. So the areas where fracking is taking place are very polluted. And air, major air pollution from fracking and also the processing facilities, making areas like the Green River Valley here in Wyoming as polluted as major cities. These are some of the chemicals released from the processing facilities because, of course, where you're doing drilling, you also have processing, compressor stations, and a lot of other infrastructure. One of the major problems with fracking, and I want to say that uh, since 2012, uh, most fracking, 80% of fracking has been for oil, but of course we hear that fracking is supposed to be for natural gas, which is a bridge fuel. Um, the evidence shows that natural gas is not a bridge fuel. Here you can see natural gas being burnt off of a, um, a process, gas processing facility in Pennsylvania. And what has come out recently, the scientific evidence, is that methane, which is what natural gas is made of, of course, is a much more potent greenhouse gas in the first 20 years that it's emitted. And that's really dangerous in these days where something has to be done um, very quickly about transitioning off of fossil fuels to avert the, the worst of catastrophic uh, climate change. So all of this methane going into the atmosphere is a very bad thing. And it also turns out that EPA is greatly undercounting the methane emissions. Of course, one of the major reasons we're concerned is that it's uh, the problem of climate change. We know more and more evidence that we are reaching a tipping point. And that's why so many people, why there's a big movement that sprung up to uh, ban fracking and keep fossil fuels in the ground. 
And then, of course, it's the people, the people who live in these communities. Uh, Kim ended up having to move, uh, leave her house because it couldn't be sold, because once fracking takes place in a neighborhood and in these areas, nobody wants to come in and buy uh, this property. So she lost everything and moved away to save her daughter's health. Um, Lots and lots of very brave people are speaking out about what's happening to their community. Surely, Eakin has lived in her home for 50 years. She's never been an activist, but she's speaking out about the, uh, the water pollution that she and her husband are experiencing. And then there are the workers. Randy Moyer uh, drove a truck that had wastewater in it and cleaned out the wastewater. He's now seriously ill and probably has lost his health uh, forever. So this is just kind of a, the beginning discussion of why fracking should be banned. And now I really want to go into the discussion of how we got here. And you'll notice that I had an opoly on the end of this book, like my earlier book, Foodopoly, because really it's the same situation. We have a few companies that have become so large that they have so much political power that they're actually dictating all of the rules about their industry. And for hundreds of years, uh, since our nation was first formed, there have been periods when monopolies were being debated. And Thomas Jefferson actually wanted to put freedom from monopoly in the Bill of Rights. Alexander Hamilton opposed this. Uh, he was especially a defender of uh, the big banks. So when you talk about fracking, we do have uh, a monopoly, and in fact, uh, many of uh, the industries related to fracking are monopolized. And I want to point to the, to the media. I think one of the reasons that there's so much disinformation about climate change, about fracking, about some of the most important issues of the day is because of what's happened to our media. In 1984, when the consolidation of industries first began, and we'll talk about why a little bit later, uh, there were 50 big media companies. And uh, there had already been several large uh, consolidations. Today, we have six major media companies. And there's very little uh, ability to have a vigorous discussion about public policy. And I believe that's because uh, one of the reasons is this interlocking board of directors and the relationships between um, financial services industry, utility industry, oil and gas, uh, media, and all of the others. So let's go back and start in the very beginning. Uh, many of you probably remember from history class J.D. Rockefeller, one of the robber barons. We learned that he rolled up the oil and gas industry by 1890, and that when Teddy Roosevelt came into office, that, um, there, that he took action uh, against Standard Oil. In fact, there was a lot of muckraking in the years after the turn of the 20th century. This is from uh, Puck, uh, a humor magazine. And you can see how uh, Standard Oil had its tentacles around the capital, around state capitals. And there was a lot of anger against Standard Oil because, of course, oil in those days was used for kerosene. Everybody needed kerosene to light uh, for lighting, and um, Rockefeller was not only ruthlessly rolling up the industry and driving his competitors out of business, he was overcharging for kerosene. So when Teddy Roosevelt came into office, we learned that uh, Standard Oil Trust was um, divided and broken up. But that's not quite what happened. What happened is that Standard Oil 
was able to write its own plan for being broken up. And when they wrote the plan, uh, J.D. Rockefeller maintained a controlling interest in each of the baby standards, and there were over 30 of them. And so he and the other directors met every day in Manhattan and continued to coordinate. And in fact, uh, about a year after the breakup, uh, Rockefeller's profits had climbed by 20%, and he continued to make more and more and more money. Now, you'll see some other companies here. Uh, obviously, Standard of New York, which used to be mobile, Standard of uh, New Jersey, Exxon. Standard of New Jersey, uh, and I'm, from now on, I'm going to use their modern names because they went through so many mergers and acquisitions. It's way too confusing uh, to talk about in this short amount of time. But after the breakup, Standard Oil of New Jersey um, ended up with half of the value of the original Standard Oil. Uh, and uh, a lot of the investments that the oil companies would make in um, the decades to come, Standard of New Jersey actually uh, um, provided the loans. Always the most aggressive, always the most powerful of the, the baby standards. Now, well, Rockefeller was um, creating Standard. After the turn of the century, there were a couple of other American companies that were formed from oil that was found in uh, Texas. And then in Europe, uh, BP and Shell were formed all around the same time, although uh, Standard was the earliest. Each of these companies have their own colorful story and uh, misbehavior uh, and misadventures, but we don't have time to talk about them tonight. But these companies were referred to in the coming decades as the Seven Sisters. Now, if you'll remember from your Greek mythology, Atlas had seven daughters who fought viciously, but when one of them was attacked, they gathered together around her and protected her. And that's why these oil companies were called the Seven Sisters. And over time, they consolidated. And this confusing chart shows how the Seven Sisters became what's referred to today as the Four Horsemen. And these companies are among the 10 largest frackers today. But they played an additional role because many of these other companies were either smaller or didn't exist through uh, most of the time that uh, the oil and gas industry has been in business. And the American sisters are the ones that had such an impact through the decades on public policy and continue to today, and that's what we're going to discuss tonight. So their impact began very early. Um, you'll remember after World War I, the British and the French decided on the lines for the new um, Middle East. They broke up the Ottoman Empire, they drew uh, new countries, and had spheres of influence that uh, probably are the root of a lot of the trouble that we see today. Now, Britain and France at that time did know that oil was going to become even more valuable in the future, and the U.S. wasn't in on that first discussion, but very soon uh, the U.S. was getting involved, and the American and um, European oil companies definitely wanted to benefit from oil in the Middle East. So in 1928, when oil was discovered in Iraq, the giant oil companies got together, a, little, a couple of the uh, smaller companies come, and they decided to discuss how this new um, oil 
uh, was going to impact uh, production. They were very concerned about production, overproduction. They were all monopolists, and so they uh, started coming up with rules about how they would fix prices and cut production. Now, the three biggest companies met shortly after this. Um, they met at a castle in Scotland, and this was in 1928. So we have the head of Exxon, the head of BP, and the head of Shell. And they met and decided on a set of principles that they would use going forward to do what they had discussed with their brethren a little bit earlier in the year. It was basically a set of principles uh, for fixing prices and how they would deal with uh, each other. And one of the things they had decided um, in their original meeting was that no one company would ever get to go to the Middle East and develop oil. They would always work jointly in concessions um, and this was a way to watch each other so that they wouldn't overproduce. And this held um, until World War II and afterwards they had uh, other ways of uh, fixing prices. So while the oil industry was being uh, uh, monopolized, uh, the utility industry was having its uh, own drama. And you may remember Samuel Insull. He was um, one of the people who worked with Thomas Edison on creating the modern uh, electric system. He was also a, a scoundrel. He lived in Chicago. And he figured out a way to control a lot of different uh, electric and gas utilities under a holding company structure. Now, a holding company is much like the trust that uh, Rockefeller used, uh, only the, um, it had a new name, a holding company. Today, we call them multinational corporations, but uh, they've gone through this uh, kind of evolution of names. So what Insul did is he had all of these different utilities, 5,030 states. And uh, the holding company kind of milked profits out of each of the uh, utilities uh, from the bottom up, charging fees, um, just uh, bilking consumers, basically. But that wasn't enough. He also set up a number of investment companies. And the investment companies sold stock over and over and over again, the same stock in these utilities. So this was some of the bad behavior that went on in the Goring 20s that led to the crash in 1929. His um, empire crashed, and uh, he actually fled to Europe because he uh, was indicted. Uh, much like Ken Lay or uh, Aubrey McClendon, if you followed the uh, uh, modern uh, fracking industry. So you can imagine that this made a lot of people mad, especially since uh, there were 600,000 investors who lost all of their money and all of the people in those communities that then didn't have uh, utility services. So when the Roosevelt administration came along, obviously there were a lot of reforms, including reforms on financial services, uh, the creation of the Securities Exchange Commission so that there would not be that kind of uh, behavior with Insul selling the same stock over and over again. But one of the most controversial bills of the time was the Public Utility Holding Company Act, and basically it regulated utilities and made it so that it was against the law to get large and sprawling like Insul's empire was. Electric utilities were supposed to focus on providing electric service, having a contiguous service territory, not gambling with their ratepayers' money. You know, all pretty uh, sensible stuff. This was such a controversial bill 
There were 600 lobbyists in Washington. It was a 200-day battle, and it passed by uh, one vote, and they kept natural gas out of it. But uh, a few years later, in 1938, the consumer advocates who were uh, state-based and concerned that a lot of urban customers were still being ripped off by the natural gas industry, they came back and passed the Natural Gas Act. And the Natural Gas Act um, did a number of things that protected uh, consumers, and if it had not been eliminated in the 1970s, we'll talk about that, we would probably not have fracking today. In fact, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have fracking and a lot of the misbehavior today. What the Natural Gas Act did is it gave to this federal agency, the Federal Power Commission, the ability to regulate the price of gas because there had been uh, such ripping off of consumers. And this uh, Federal Power Commission looked at the cost of production and the transport of the gas. Uh, set a price, and then gave the companies uh, a fair profit, which was between 1940 and 1965, 5.7 to 6.5%. Pretty good percentage. Um, steady uh, um, investment opportunity um, in those days. Now, of course, this really infuriated uh, the gas industry, the electric industry was uh, really angry about um, the Public Utility Holding Company Act, and they started working against it. But one of the things that happened is that World War II intervened. Now, during World War II, there were a lot of advances in the technologies for drilling and, uh, and also for making pipes. And I thought that this big inch, little inch pipeline is pretty interesting. It was the biggest public project during World War II. It took 16 million, or I mean 16,000 um, people to build it. It went from Texas uh, to Chicago, both of them, and then the little uh, inch went, veered off to the Northeast. And after the war, this pipe was privatized. It was sold at uh, below the cost of actually building it. And today, Williams Company owns this pipeline, and it's still used. But I, I think the takeaway is that a, a lot of the technologies uh, for the oil and gas industry uh, really advanced, and the industry got an even firmer grip on public policy. After the war, the, the production of oil doubled in part for the production of plastic. Half of uh, all oil was used for, for making plastic after that. And after the war, the uh, fight back against these protective laws began again. This is Leland Olds. He was a progressive, um, served three terms in the Federal Power Commission, very much a consumer advocate, and the oil and gas companies absolutely despised him. So in 1948, when Bob Kerr was elected uh, to the Senate from Oklahoma, um, Bob Kerr owned Kerr McGee, a large oil um, company that went on to also produce uh, uranium and was recently bought by the fracking company Anadarko. But Bob Kerr was one of the biggest protectors of the oil and gas industry and a real red baiter. So he red baited uh, Leland Olds and a lot of other people who were consumer advocates and Olds lost his federal power uh, commission position. And uh, Kerr went on to um, really uh, uh, spend his time, his 15 years in Congress uh, as a senator. He died in office in 1963. His business was uh, protecting the oil and gas industry. And um, one of his um, favorite policies, because it benefited him 
um, uh, personally was the uh, special tax break that the oil and gas company get, uh, get for actually producing oil. It's a uh, allowance for um, using up their, um, their oil reserves. So every time they drill for oil, and uh, this is still a benefit today, uh, today they get a 15% a tax break on every drop that they drill for. It used to be um, almost 28%. So this is one of the policies that he fought for. And uh, this, these were the types of uh, public policies that the oil and gas industry was able to get in the tax code. And once it's in the tax code, it's very difficult um, to get it out. Now, the other thing that was really going on in this period was um, the oil and gas industry, the American sisters, attempt to be exempted from antitrust law or conspiring to be exempt from antitrust law. So they didn't have to meet in castles anymore. They had people like John J. McCloy, a Harvard-trained lawyer, who could defend them when they got in trouble. And McCloy is a very interesting character. I have to admit, I ended up, I found him so interesting, I read a thousand page biography about him. I'd never heard of this man before, but uh, yeah, talk about a scoundrel. He had uh, started in the uh, Roosevelt administration, assistant secretary of war, and served nine presidents. He's one, he was, uh, represents that kind of official who works for both parties, who maintains some official role. And he played a, a, a pretty bad role in public policy. When he was at the uh, uh, War Department, he's one of the people who made the decision to intern the Japanese uh, to uh, not take action against the uh, German um, um, death camps, and then he was appointed by Truman to uh, be the pro council of Germany after the war, uh, war until a government could be set up. But all during this time, he also was an advisor to the Rockefeller uh, family, uh, their lawyer for a lot of um, uh, business dealings. Uh, he also had a lot of other roles in public policy where he advocated for the oil and gas industry. He was the chairman of the uh, Ford Foundation, uh, on the board of the World Bank, on the Warren Commission. And uh, all along, every time the oil and gas industry got into trouble or got into a, a debate with one of the um, countries in the Middle East, he was sent as a diplomat or on their behalf to uh, uh, help them get out of scraps. And uh, often it was around antitrust. The companies wanted to be able to uh, work together to keep the price that they paid the uh, oil producing nations low. And in fact, um, from the beginning, they paid about 10% of what the uh, oil industry made in terms of profits. So, you know, there was a lot of going back and forth. The oil producers, or the countries that owned the resources were very angry. And uh, what he did is he made arrangements with several administrations uh, to actually exempt the oil industry from antitrust laws. This began with the Kennedy administration so that they could uh, get together and and decide on a price that they would offer to the, uh, um, the, the nations that had the resources. And he actually got exemption letters uh, beginning with the Kennedy administration all the way uh, through the Carter administration. And uh, uh, after he retired, he was interviewed once, and he said his job was to keep the, uh, the oil industry out of jail. So, um, you know, and as I was saying earlier, 
Uh, Thomas Jefferson wasn't worried about consumer prices. He was worried about political power. And that's really what happened when the oil and gas industry was able to get so, so large and to continue consolidating. It just became way too powerful. So Fracopoly is full of uh, um, villains like uh, McCloy, but there are also a lot of uh, heroes and heroines. And Senator Paul Douglas is one of those people who uh, uh, continued to investigate the monopoly infringement uh, of the oil and gas industry. One of his hearings had 30,000 pages of testimony. And when you look through uh, this documentation, you see all of the misbehavior of these companies and how they lied and uh, uh, strategized together. So by the 1970s, um, one of the ways that they were trying to weaken uh, the law around natural gas and natural gas being regulated was called uh, winter politics. And basically what they decided was that the uh, members of Congress who were actually looking at the industry and trying to curtail their bad behavior, they would restrict... Um, natural gas shipments to that part of the country that were necessary for heating and to punish them and to begin to uh, demand um, that deregulation take place so that they could basically make higher profits. And this was admitted in testimony in, in Congress. And at, at this point, even the New York Times in 1970 uh, admitted that um, that the gas shortage was artificially induced. Now, if you look it up on the internet, you'll see all of these sites that are trade associations for the gas industry, and they'll talk about how horrible regulation was because it was keeping the, the companies from being able to produce, and uh, it was uh, causing a gas shortage. So they've, they've really been rewriting history. Then, um, this was, of course, during the uh, Nixon administration, who was uh, put in office in part by uh, oil and gas money. One of the chapters of Fracopoly begins with a executive from Pennzoil um, getting on a plane with a suitcase of $700,000 to uh, uh, deliver to the uh, Nixon administration. And, uh, and the Nixon administration had about $20 million uh, that was uh, clandestinely uh, organized by corporate interests. And one of the biggest interests was the, the oil and gas industry. Now, Nixon did a lot of things that we don't have time to get into, but I, I do want to mention uh, uh, that I mean that are related to oil and gas, not just all of his bad behavior. But uh, one thing I want to mention is uh, an appointment that he made, actually a little bit about the, the person he appointed before he was appointed. And I'm talking about um, Lewis Powell, who... Uh, Nixon went on to appoint to be a Supreme uh, Court Justice, who uh, people refer to as a liberal today in, in comparison to many of the members of the Supreme Court that uh, we have. But he um, um, was certainly not much of a liberal, and he was a corporate lawyer from uh, Richmond, Virginia, and uh, did a lot of work for the tobacco industry, was very active in the Chamber of Commerce. Now, uh, you will remember, those of you who are old enough, that in the 1960s and beginning of the 1970s, there was a cultural revolution going on. There was a lot of fight back against Vietnam. There was the war in court that ex had extended rights to all sorts of classes of people who had not enjoyed rights. And there was a, um, a change in the society of this country, making it more humanistic. There were a number of economic and social conservative interests who did not like the direction that this country was going in. 
Lewis Powell was one of them. And he wrote this memo that was a real marker for when our democracy started to be stolen. And I, you know, I think it's one of the ways that the oil and gas industry and a lot of other industries have been able to subvert uh, our nation's laws. So he wrote this, um, this memo, sometimes called a manifesto. Um, uh, if you haven't heard about this, go home and Google the Powell memo and read it. It's very, very interesting. He lays out a plan for basically taking back the country from liberal interests. And he talks about how it's uh, a long range, it, it's a long range that uh, it will take planning of a scale that a number of corporations or economic interests would have to engage in. He talks about how all of the institutions um, were uh, supporting these liberal values. He meant faith, the media, um, he, just very, very critical of everything that was going on in the 1960s and 1970s. And what Lewis Powell did beyond write this uh, plan for really, um, I would say, subverting our democracy, he went out and helped organize money to put the plan into motion. So he raised money from the uh, the core, the conservative uh, right-wing Coors family in Colorado, from the Koch family, uh, from the Mellon Scafes of the banking and Gulf oil family. And they started setting up uh, hundreds of institutions, uh, right-wing think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, Cato, many, many others funding universities, a whole plan to basically uh, change the values of the, of the country. Powell also wrote the first decision um, that made, uh, gave corporations um, the right to speech in elections. So really uh, the first um, action uh, that really set the course towards Citizens United. And this did indeed begin to change the country. And also at this time, Democrats started um, receiving campaign contributions from corporations. So getting back to the story of oil and gas and uh, how they began to be able to influence public policy, during the Carter era, uh, a number of things happened besides the uh, oil crisis. Um, this is a picture of Carter signing a legislation to um, create the Department of Energy. So one of the things that Carter did was reorganize all of the energy functions in the federal government so that they would all be br brought together under the Department of Energy. And um, he also, well, then, Natural gas, the, the battle that Kerr and others had been engaged in uh, during Carter's the same period, the Natural Gas uh, Policy Act passed, and that began the deregulation of natural gas. The Federal Power Commission was eliminated, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was made an independent agency inside of the Department of Energy that Jimmy Carter had uh, created. So the Department of Energy uh, began to be funded for a lot of research, some of, it renewal, some of it for renewables and energy efficiency, although recently uh, the uh, congressional uh, services looked at how much money had been spent on research, uh, energy research, and they found that uh, Eighty percent of it had been spent for, and this was from the end of 1940 through um, 2014, I believe. Uh, a, about 80 percent of it had been spent on fossil fuels and nuclear power and the rest on renewables and uh, energy efficiency. So the bulk of funding since then has gone uh, towards these polluting technologies. And it was during the Carter administration that the research began for uh, unconventional shale drilling. 
And um, um, a lot of the re research for fracking began at that time. So there, this, there was a sea change that took place under the Carter administration, even though Jimmy Carter's uh, time in office is often remembered as being kind of the birth of the renewable uh, period of growth for renewable energy. But it also was the beginning of, uh, uh, of fracking. And as I said, um, billions of dollars spent in gover government research for all sorts of uh, technologies related to oil and gas. And this began in 1913. Uh, research, our tax dollars uh, being spent um, for, uh, for the industry. Just to give you an idea, of, I mean, this is just a few of the um, technologies and um, other things that were developed that have led to fracking today. And these things in the smaller print are the more recent uh, things related to, uh, to fracking. And so what's happened since uh, the time that uh, natural gas was deregulated? And that basically meant that there no longer um, did the federal government set the price for interstate gas. Pipelines uh, were no longer regulated in the same way. Uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission was given authority to look at these projects. So what's happened since then? Um, between 1984 and 2014, we had um, more than 900,000 uh, miles of pipelines built. And of course, today, as you know, many uh, thousands of miles of pipelines are uh, being funded. In fact, um, it's one of the things that really makes it a joke that natural gas is a bridge fuel because uh, the financial services industry is spending billions of dollars uh, loaning billions of dollars for this kind of infrastructure development. So. Um, um, we have a lot of pipelines, 2.5 million uh, miles, and that is really just, um, we really don't know how many uh, miles of pipelines because the, the smaller gathering lines aren't regulated in, in most states, and these uh, are continuing to be built as uh, fracking uh, is taking place. So. We covered the Carter era, and now I want to really talk about what happened uh, to our antitrust laws, because they were really eviscerated under the Reagan administration. And, and this has been forgotten. In fact, it, it was fairly uh, hidden anyway, unless this is an issue that you particularly follow. But uh, this is Robert Bork, and those of you who are uh, old enough to remember uh, this period of time uh, will know that uh, uh, President Reagan uh, tried to appoint him as a Supreme Court justice, and it was uh, fortunately stopped. But he was a, a right-wing legal scholar um, that believed in the the, uh, that the market was perfect and self-adjusting. And of course, the Reagan administration adhered to uh, uh, this philosophy. And um, what happened when the president was elected is that he appointed um, heads of the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission who would uh, go on to cut the staff, cut the budget, and basically change the definition of what an antitrust violation was. So rather than it being about um, uh, monopolies, having too much political power, being bad for small businesses, uh, what they changed it to is basically that uh, monopolies were okay because they could lower prices for consumers. And ever since that time, every uh, president since then has uh, basically not 
uh, even used the existing uh, laws on the book about antitrust to enforce um, our mono or what's left of the monopoly laws. And so we see not just the oil and gas, but just about every industry has been allowed to become so consolidated that we have three or four or sometimes two industries or companies that dominate an industry. And that gives them a lot of political power, huge budgets, lots of ability to dictate the rules around their, um, around their company. And is one of the reasons that, um, that we've actually had a lot of job loss. And of course, um, this got worse under the Clinton administration. And uh, the deregulation of the financial services industry, commodities, uh, electricity deregulation, which I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about in a moment. Uh, but all of these things, um, the free trade agreements, put the power over the oil and gas industry and, and uh, our are rather than our nation or our local and state governments being able to make decisions. This puts uh, the decision-making power in the hands of unaccountable uh, uh, global agencies like the World Trade Organization or as uh, NAFTA set up uh, this uh, dispute settlement process that lets investors actually s sue uh, countries or localities. So this has all benefited uh, the oil and gas industry as uh, well as many other uh, industries. So some of the, the big oil and gas mergers took place under the uh, Clinton administration. Things got a lot worse under um, the Bush administration, of course. Um, what we saw was that many of the um, changes around the electric industry that I mentioned with the Clinton slide uh, began to uh, uh, happen when George Bush came into office. And what electricity deregulation basically did is it created a wholesale electric market for, mar for the power marketing industry, which uh, allowed the natural gas uh, companies um, to um, build natural gas-fired plants. And um, for the first time, gas was traded on uh, the stock market. That began in the early 1990s. And it actually incentivized selling more and more and more energy rather than keeping uh, energy from being misused. It set up this system that um, made... Um, made the industry uh, benefit from, uh, economically benefit from selling more energy. And we also, also saw some retail uh, deregulation in some states, uh, which caused many, many problems. And then under the Bush administration, we basically had uh, the Energy Policy Act passed that uh, began to benefit the oil and gas industry even more. So most people are familiar with the Halberton loophole, which exempted the oil and gas industry from the Safe Drinking Water Act. And of course, there are uh, more than 400 chemicals that can be used in the fracking process. The industry doesn't have to disclose what those chemicals are. Um, but uh, we know of what a lot of them are because of testing that has been done. And the Public Utility Holding Company Act that I mentioned earlier, it was repealed, and that changed the, the way that the electric industry is structured. So today we have about 20 large electric utilities that produce more than 50% of the power in the um, in the country, and they are larger and larger uh, companies, and they engage in all sorts of different businesses, and they adhere to the all-of-the-above strategy. So some of them may have a little bit of renewables, but many of them are building gas-fired plants. 
And, uh, and they also have a lot of political power in the states that they operate. And then the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which you probably are familiar with because uh, if you've um, followed at all the infrastructure projects planned for uh, Oregon and Washington, the pipes and uh, liquefied natural gas plants, uh, FERC is the agency that makes uh, the decisions, and FERC's um, authority was greatly enhanced by the Policy Act of 2005. It was given the authority over one of our nation's most important laws, the National Environmental Policy Act, which um, requires that an uh, environmental impact statement be done for big projects, big development projects, infrastructure projects. So FERC, an agency that basically does the business in the oil and gas and electric industry, now has the authority to um, oversee these environmental assessments. And it was also uh, given the power to decide on infrastructure projects that are interstate. So that's why FERC has uh, been making decisions about some of the infrastructure projects um, in the Northwest. And, um, we were very surprised, although pleased, to see FERC turn down the two LNG plants and the, uh, the pipeline, the uh, Pacific uh, Connector, because usually they just go ahead with all of these uh, projects. And of course, those projects are uh, being appealed. So with uh, the Halberton loophole, with, the, with these changes in policy, uh, this really allowed fracking to take off in a major way, and it allowed people like Aubrey McClendon, who actually his uh, great uncle was Bob Kerr, who I spoke about earlier from Oklahoma. And of course, McClendon uh, died uh, mysteriously recently, the uh, day after he was indicted for antitrust violations. Of course, McClendon had been the CEO of Chesapeake, one of the big frackers. And uh, the, basically, the way he did his business was he was addicted to debt, barred millions of dollars, high interest loans, and uh, gambled, he and his partner gambled on the stock market. They lost fortunes uh, several times. Finally, uh, activist stockholders uh, kicked him out of uh, uh, his position as CEO of Chesapeake. But one of his business techniques was selling leases. So Chesapeake would drill, say there's great resources here, and then bundle those leases and sell them often to foreign companies. So he was... Um, wasn't really in the, the business of um, drilling for natural gas as much as being in the business of gambling and uh, making large sums of money and then uh, losing them. But he t typifies the, um, the kind of um, people who have been really prominent in the oil and gas industry all, uh, all along. And unfortunately, the Obama administration has been uh, very friendly to fracking and to the oil and gas industry, uh, but especially gas, even though most fracking has been for oil. And um, you see here uh, uh, Heather Zeichel, who was a, uh, she's in the corner over there, she was the person who um, developed uh, Obama's 2008 platform and was his advisor on energy and climate change until uh, um, about three years ago. She was very friendly to the oil and gas industry. For instance, during some of the, uh, the period when a lot of the um, controversy was going on about the investigations into water pollution, she met 20 times with the oil and gas industry, four times with environmental groups. She eventually left the Obama administration and became a director of 
um, one of the big LNG uh, companies and got to be, uh, in her first year, got a $400,000 in stock from Chineri. So very friendly to the oil and gas industry. Uh, Moniz up here is the uh, um, Secretary of uh, Energy, has a long history at MIT and been a uh, advisor and a consultant for the oil and gas industry and a big supporter of fracking. Uh, Gina McCarthy at EPA has been there uh, during uh, much of the controversy around a uh, report that EPA was supposed to be doing on water pollution. We had high hopes for this report, but um, in the end, they, uh, they did not do the kind of research they had promised. And they, um, they wrote a report that, that didn't look at um, the fracking sites before fracking was um, going on and then afterwards. They were supposed to do prospective research and then see what happens after fracking has um, started. And of course, they used the industry's uh, data. So um, they didn't do that kind of study, although they do have several instances of water pollution in this study. And uh, when it was released last year, it was released with a, a press release and a lot of fanfare saying no systemic um, water problems found. But if you look through the text, this isn't true, and we found out that this, um, this change was made uh, to the um, title of the press release and kind of the beginning of this 800-page report after a meeting with the, re um, the White House. But there was so much controversy around this that the EPA's advisory committee has actually said that um, there's a major problem with this and that they have to, they criticized the report and said that they have to go back and uh, uh, actually uh, provide some proof that there isn't um, water pollution happening from, from fracking. So we've just seen um, a lot of problems. Uh, there were three investigations started about the uh, water pollution in Pennsylvania, Wyoming, and Texas, and uh, problems were found. And uh, then, um, right before President Obama's re-election in 2012, during the campaign, all of the studies were closed down. So, very concerned about how the Obama administration has really uh, responded. And uh, um, one of the things that impacted communities are asking is that President Obama, before he leaves office, actually meet meet with them, hear their stories, and um, you know, take some kind of action before he leaves office. So what has this meant, all of this fracking? Um, well, we know that the history of the oil and gas industry is one of booms, busts, booms and busts. And that has been true ever since the beginning of the industry. So right now, we're in a bust. But we can be sure that the price of oil will increase in the next couple of years. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion that the industry is on the rocks. Um, you know, this will be um, one of the ways that we will um, see that the industry actually uh, is not making money. And this might be one of the ways that um, alternative energy will be able to get more funding and be able to uh, uh, move forward. But unfortunately, this is not the history of the oil and gas industry. What happens is that when prices are low, the consolidation increases. And so we see these bigger companies uh, beginning to pick up uh, the smaller companies. This truly is the history of the industry. and. Um, uh, Shell has just made a, a big deal. So what we've seen with all of the policies in place is that 
natural gas is continuing to rise. And while wind and solar are rising too, they're not rising as quickly. And often we hear solar has increased by 5,000%. Well, that is true, but 5,000% of 0.1 uh, isn't a whole lot. And we need to, we really, really must do better. We need different policies. And uh, you can see where the shale um, plays are. And this is some of the places that uh, natural gas-fired power plants are being planned. And they match up with where these shale fields are. And, you know, this is not the direction that we want to be going in. And uh, this is just a, um, really, our energy mix. So we can see that coal is continuing to decline, and it will continue to decline because policies have been put in place to restrict coal. Nuclear um, is kind of on a on the, the same line, although we are beginning to see some nuclear plants uh, that probably will close down. But natural gas is rising, and these are the newest statistics, 2015 statistics. For the first time, we see natural gas and coal at a, about the right, um, at the same place, 33%. So um, this is our work ahead of us, right, is that we really need to move transition very quickly into renewables and keep fossil fuels in the ground. And it means that we have to fight for the policies that will actually push renewables. And there are a lot of things going on right now, like the Koch brother funded uh, attack on uh, net metering, uh, when people have solar on their roofs, they want to be able to sell the electricity back uh, to their local utility. And this is one of the schemes that the oil and gas industry and the, uh, the Koch brothers are funding this scheme to start um, state by state, uh, the states that have net metering to try to get rid of it. And we need really, really strong renewable portfolio standards. Because, you know, since I worked on renewables in the 1990s, I've been hearing, I'm sure you've heard it, that the market is going to do this. And if the market was going to do it alone without policies, we would already be there, right? We'd already be in that renewable future. We have to start fighting for renewables now. And I'm pretty excited about the movement victories. And I think that... Um, it's amazing that when we first started working on fracking and calling for a ban on fracking in 2011, we were literally told, you know, this doesn't pass the laugh test. And we're seeing action all around the country. I mean, there are literally thousands of people working on all of these battles. And um, I think one of the... One of the things that's a real testament to the movement is today more people are against fracking, recent polls have shown, than for fracking, when at one time um, there was a very high percentage of Americans uh, in favor of fracking. And I think it's also amazing that in the Democratic nomination for the presidency that fracking has become a major issue. I mean, that's a tribute to all of the people who are working on this issue and who are really saying that we have to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And there is a movement um, all over the country. In about 40 states, people are working. I mean, we have federal legislation uh, to um, ban fracking on... Um, public lands, and uh, now have 37 sponsors in the House. Huge climate justice movement. And um, we're very excited that July 24th in Philadelphia, there is going to be a march for a clean energy revolution. This is the day before the Democratic Convention. Because, of course, we, in a number of states, we have Democratic governors who are 
uh, in favor of fracking and, in fact, um, supporting policies for fracking. And we really need a change in the Democratic Party, both parties, um, but um, we're going to have this very large march for an energy revolution. And if anybody is on the East Coast, uh, we would love for you to come. Um, it's going to be very exciting, and we think there will be thousands of people there. So um, with that, I think that we will take some questions. Yes. Um, how much did uh, President Reagan f fit into the uh, Powell memo where he was elected to shift the country, Reagan was elected to shift the country to a conservative bent, and um, Reagan was put up as the candidate to do that. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I mean, he... Uh, a lot of those same interests did fund his campaign. And they, I mean, that had been a strategy, uh, an ongoing strategy since Goldwater, actually. But the, uh, it, um, it had a lot more financial support. So, yes. Hi, my name is Elise Rome. And uh, thank you so much for being here. This is a real eye-opener. Um, I come from the state of California originally, who unfortunately has a governor right now who is being criticized for kind of turning a blind eye to the um, oil, California oil industry and their practices of fracking and enhanced oil recovery. Um, the California Department of Gas and Oil the regulatory agency that's supposed to oversee and regulate, they basically give free passes. Mm -hmm. And what the actual act of fracking and drilling does, it contaminates the aquifers. And we're talking about food and water mm -hmm. watch, right? So here's a personal story of an impact that I want you all to know about because I come from an area in northeast Orange County, it's south of Los Angeles, where the oil industry has been there for over 100 years, all over California. Um, there Will Be Blood, the Daniel Day-Lewis movie, that's a good history about that. But um, my family was served contaminated water. My school, Esperanza High School, East Anaheim, it's right on the border of Yorba Linda. Yorba Linda is owned and operated by the oil industry. Their, one of their recent mayor's wife used to work for the oil industry. It's all these smaller agencies. They get in there and they own it all politically. And the people, it's the land of gracious living, Yorba Linda, right? Richard Nixon's birthplace. So what we've discovered, we just put up a, a Facebook page for our alumni from our high school. We had no idea about any of this. Our homes were built on abandoned oil wells. We have now discovered a cancer cluster, not just cancers, but birth defects, babies born with breast lumps, um, multiple myeloma, terribly, um, you know, lots of rare cancers. My father died in my, uh, in high school, when I was in high school from colon cancer. So this is the real personal reason we're doing this and what I thank you for your work and all of the, your partner organizations. It, it's a serious thing. Once you get, when you have an aquifer contaminated, you can't clean it up. And so the oil industry, they see the writing on the wall, so now they're diversifying. So what they did was they formed these uh, standalone companies that are now development companies. They own all this toxic land, and now they're developing houses. So all these years they've been murdering the residents, and now they're making more money off of these taxpayers, building houses on top, on top of abandoned oil wells, which no one's regulating, nobody's seeing if they're leaking, creating more health effects. So this is why this is important that we get this word out. Thank you. Okay, any, any other question? Hi, 
I'm not sure if I can phrase this very well, but I'd like to suggest that perhaps the, the problem, the struggle, is not about fracking or <clears throat> oil or electricity, et cetera, et cetera. It's about the multinational financial, financial mm -hmm. co companies who, in fact, provide the money, the loans that support these um, oil companies, et cetera, and who can therefore, by their policies and their decisions, affect what in the end trickles down to us. And though I greatly support what we're doing at the ground level, I think that's the only way we can go in this country. Would you comment on what can be done about the international financial companies? Well, I, you know, it's certainly the financial services industry um, looms over top uh, of much of this. And um, no matter what industry you're focused on, much of the drive to get bigger and be more powerful comes from the financial services industry. And, you know, they're very uh, closely connected. In fact, Goldman Sachs now is the uh, largest seller of the commodity of natural gas. So they not only trade, loan money, uh, they now uh, actually own the commodity itself and are signing long-term contracts. So, you know, obviously there has to be a reform of our economic system. We need to retool our economic system so it's uh, not based on uh, an oil economy and so that we don't have, you know, a handful of people at the top that profit from these unsustainable types of businesses. It's going to take a political revolution, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I'm trying try to phrase this in a way that it's a question. <laughs> um, I'm from Tacoma, and we're trying to stop this LNG plant. And we're having a lot of difficulties because we're running up against uh, what they call state and national federal laws. And we're, we're kind of like just, you know, confused because we know that Colorado and Oregon, we're, they're all fighting these same battles. Mm -hmm. And you have the city councils and the ports saying, you have to change the the state law, the federal law, we can't do anything. You know, you as citizens can't do anything. And I'd like to know your opinion, you know, about how we can, you know, we can uh, yeah. protect the water, water laws because there are citizen laws, you know, our rights that are being trampled upon in the name of, you know, corporations that yeah. are usually not mentioned, you know. But that is the uh, Citizens United that we're fighting. It's it's all these things at once, and it's like we're, you know, individuals that are trying to find yeah. ways. So, I, what would you suggest? Well, what we find with infrastructure, and I mean pipes and the LNG plants, is if you get there early when the state and local permitting process is going on, and every state regulates their oil and gas industry. So the laws are different in every state. If you get there early in many states, and we were able to stop infrastructure, some infrastructure projects in New York, for instance, like Port Ambrose, uh, which is a, a terminal, um, like the one that you're trying to fight, and a pipeline because um, the state could do it. But if, if you get there later and the local approvals have been given and you're dependent on FERC, it's much, much more difficult to stop it. And in fact, what happened with Jordan Cove and or Oregon LNG, it's very in unusual that FERC rejected those. And um, EPA as well to have well, to national yeah, Get EPA together. doesn't have authority over these infrastructure projects. That's, that's FERC. You know, I think it, we're going to have to uh, either uh, eliminate FERC, um, <laughs> which um, FERC's power really needs to be taken away. I mean, FERC is a recent, recently created agency, and there, there is a movement to create a kind of a national coalition to take FERC's power 
of condemning land, eminent domain power away from them, which would take an act of Congress. But what we're finding is in a lot of parts of the country, you know, this isn't a, a like a, a um, left-right issue. This is a property rights issue. So it is possible that maybe in the not too um, far future, we might be able to build the political power to take that, that particular power away from FERC. Although I think, you know, we need a complete reform of the Department of Energy. I mean, we need the Marshall Plan for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, right? We don't need an agency that's focused on uh, dirty energy. So I, I, it's part of all of these political changes that we're, we're fighting for, and it is very difficult uh, admitted to stop these infrastructure projects unless you can, um, unless there's state authority and then finding who has the power at the state level. Um, that, I mean, that's how we've been successful in, in places to, uh, uh, for instance, ban fracking in a state like New York. You have to see who has the power. In that case, it was the governor. And um, I don't know the law in, um, in Washington, but in our case, is, there's a, I think our strongest thing is that we have laws that we value, you know, concerning the clean air and water and, and also individual rights mm -hmm. of people, you know, and their farm and their land. Right. So, so that's kind of something. Yeah. yeah. Well, best of luck in your fight and let us know if we can be helpful. Okay, maybe one more question. Hi there. Um, I, want, I might not have the exact uh, facts straight, but I believe that the Rockefeller grandchildren are in charge of a very large endowment, and they're looking at divesting away from fossil fuels in, into um, non-fossil fuels. So can you talk about that? Is that just window dressing that they're trying to put on, and do we see more of this type of divestment from um, fossil fuel and oil companies, and is there anything as, you know, 401k, subscribers that we can do in order to try to pressure um, some more of this stuff because you tied a little bit um, the financial aspect to it. Mm -hmm. What can we do as individuals? And when I see these kind of, uh, you know, New York Times headlines about these companies trying to divest, is that really happening or is that just window dressing? Well, it is true. I think that um, one of the big Rockefeller foundations is divesting. You know, I think they have... Uh, not been in the oil business for, for a while. They've had some investments in it, but I think it's been fairly small. So I, I do think that's happening, although I do think um, many large foundations have, um, you know, kind of um, been part of the status quo and have not wanted to really uh, move as quickly as we should to renewables. I mean, I think there is a real divestment uh, campaign going on, and some of these uh, larger companies are divesting. Um, I'm not convinced that will solve the problem. I think we're going to need to make major political changes because when you, you can't leave the financial services industry in charge of something so important as our climate, right? So divestment might be a good thing, but there, um, this funding also goes to uh, sometimes other things that aren't, uh, aren't sustainable also. So, um, you know, I think it's six of one and a half dozen of another. And um, I do think there is a lot of pressure there from some larger um, investment funds to get out of oil and gas. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>